Hey Nate, um, when you log into a machine, did you know that over in etsypam.d that there is a file called login that has the rules for how we authenticate users to log in? No, I totally didn't know that. Well, I mean, I, I did know that, but you know, <laughs> maybe other folks don't. <laughs> um, you, you can see some other files over here, SSHD. So there's yep. a way that you can have PAM use, or you can have SSHD use PAM and it would use the rules in the SSHD file. There's sudo, right? So when you run sudo and it's authenticating your user to make sure that you're allowed to sudo things, guess what it's doing? It's using the sudo PAM configuration file. Let's take a look at login for a second. So this is what it looks like. And essentially, PAM is used in a variety of ways to authenticate and set up users to be able to use the system. There are several types of rules. So you can see that first column in this file, we have auth rules, which will authenticate someone's identity. Rules, which verify their account is in good standing with the system. Password rules. If someone is trying to change their password, this is how we enforce those changes. The last set are session rules. After we've authenticated them and verified their account is in good standing, these are the additional things we should do to establish their session with the system. So those are the general types of rules that you'll see in a PAM configuration, auth, account, password, and session. The second column is the severity of the rule. And we'll see a couple different options here, but the ones I'd like to draw your attention to are required and optional. All right, so required means that we're gonna run something, we're gonna test something, and you're required to get a valid value from that test. And if you don't get a valid value or you get a negative response from the test, you will be unable to progress. Optional, we're gonna run this test and we'll get a value back from the test, but we really don't care what it is. If you pass the test, great. If you fail the test, that's okay too. There are a couple others that we will see in our PAM journey. We will see requisite. Requisite and required are similar. Required will actually, if you fail the test, it'll still continue processing the rest of the rules. If you fail that test, we don't test it further. Often required is used, but requisite is not used you may see it sneaking around places. And the other thing that we don't see in this file, but we'll see in another one in just a minute, is sufficient. If you pass this test, that is sufficient. You don't have to pass any other rules. It's like good enough. If you pass this one, it's good enough. The third column, the PAM library that is called, right? We're gonna do something uh, to test the state of something or to validate a piece of data and that's gonna come back with a true or false value. And what we're seeing there in that third column is the actual executable or shared object library that's gonna be invoked to test criteria. You can see further down in this uh, session rule that's optional. So these libraries can take arguments. In this case, we're passing the force argument and the revoke argument. And those arguments can customize the behavior of this test. All right, so that's an overview of what we're looking at in one of these files. There's other stuff that I didn't, that I just kind of glossed over, like substack and include. So substack says we're going to uh, test a certain amount of stuff from another file in the PAM configuration, and include is similar. We're going to include rules from another file. So it's common to do things like check someone's password. And so we could put the test, the PAM test, check someone's password in login and SSHD and SU and sudo and like all these individual configuration files, or because it's so common, we could put it in one place, system off, and everybody checks it there. If we want to make a change, like add an argument to how passwords are checked, we can add it to the system auth entry and because everyone else refers to that other file, us changing that file makes everybody else pick up the change. The um, include in Substack does is it allows us to reference rules stored somewhere else, 
for this service or ham check. All right, so now it starts to get pretty complicated because if we look at system auth, there's more account auth password and session rules. Those were included from our login rules that we had to check. And so I kind of mashed these two files together so we could trace through what a sample login authentication would. So on the left side is the rules from login. And at several points, we saw that the login rules called the system auth rules. And so what I did was I put the system auth rules on the right side and I positioned them in the correct locations. And so that's why there's like gaps between the two of them is because we like go over here and check some rules and then we come back over here and then we go over here to check some rules and then we come back over here. So if you're logging into the system on one of the TTYs, um, we're gonna authenticate your user. Did you provide the right password for a user that exists on the system? The PAM login file says, we should use the rules out of system auth for that. So there are three rules over in system auth. The first one is required. So we're going to set some environment variables and the PAM ENV library will always return a true value unless you're not able to execute it for some reason. So if you're not able to run PAM ENV, that's when you get a failure. This is a required rule. So if you fail a required rule, you're not able to authenticate. But the environment variable setting stuff in PAM is pretty much bulletproof. So you're going to get a pass on that. Like you'd have to have somebody deleted this file. That's how you would fail. The next one is a sufficient rule. If you pass this rule, that's good enough. And we don't have to check anything else. We make a call to PAM Unix. PAM Unix is the thing that does Unix style authentication. So we asked you for your password and your account, like your username, and we're going to go over, we're going to check it against something to make sure that that's the right stuff. And so I'm going to put Nate on the spot. Nate, when checking a username and password on a machine, where do you look? For a local machine, it'd be Etsy password and Etsy shadow. Pam Unix takes that user account you gave as your username, checks it against Etsy password, takes that password you gave, checks it against Etsy shadow. And if you are successful, you're authenticated to the system. If you gave the wrong username and password and we're not able to validate it with our standard Unix authentication stuff, then you get a PAM deny call and PAM deny will always fail. Always. And because it's required, because you failed the required rule, you can't authenticate to the system. All right, now the reason that we do this, and let me go into edit mode here, is if we had multiple ways to authenticate people, we're talking about authenticating against a central authentication location. So if you were to configure, say, LDAP, what would happen is if you use one of the Red Hat tools to configure yourself against LDAP, it would put a extra rule in system auth and probably a couple other places. There's a library for PAM called PAM LDAP that handles LDAP authentication. If you're logging into the system, we'd first check to see if you're giving me a local user account. And if you're giving me a local user account, that's good enough. You've proved that you've authenticated. But if you fail to give me a local user account, then I'm going to check the LDAP server. And if you gave me a correct LDAP server user account and password, that's enough. I'll let you into the machine. But if you neither give me a local account nor give me a LDAP server user account that's correct, then you get PAM deny, which doesn't let you authenticate. The more authentication methods you configure, the more of these sufficient rules you'll see in there, because we're going to try them in order to see if, you know, is it from this person or is it stored over here in this source so that we can give you multiple different ways of potentially authenticating the machine. Does Pam have an implied deny at the end? So if someone were to do something dumb, like drop that Pam deny, would they still get denied if they didn't succeed in any of these or would it default to letting them in? That'd be silly. <laughs> It depends on the other rules. Did not, if you pass the required rule of PAM ENV and you didn't get either of the sufficient rules because you didn't have a local user account or an LDAP user account, you're not required to pass a sufficient rule. 
potentially you passed all the required rules and that's good enough. So the PAM deny is there to like make sure that if you don't hit, if you don't match any of the sufficients, you right. will get denial. And it's required, which means if you fail it, you can't authenticate. So yeah, like ordering in these files can be important. The actual libraries called can be important. So that's uh now that that can be daunting to edit by hand like this. So there are tools that make this easier. But there's auth config, I think, it still exists, or something similar to it that'll that'll help you configure PAM rules. Yeah. And uh, in fact, if we look at the original PAM configuration files that I went from, oops. Oops, system auth. I notice that it says at the very top, there's a comment that says, this file is auto-generated. The you next go. run auth select, it'll obliterate this file. And there you so go, auth select, you, that's the tool I'm looking for. If you're using manual changes of this file, you can't use any of the automated stuff anymore because it'll not know about your manual changes. All right, so I want to, now that we understand the flow of PAM, I want to come back and actually show some changes. All right, so, um, our first one, I mentioned that PAM libraries will take options. Uh, I'm going to become the rel user and look at the U mask for the rel user. And Nate, something that's bothered me recently was there, a there was a change in U mask behavior in rel nine, where if you were in a private group, it didn't, it set your U mask more restrictively to remove write permissions from the group by default. And I couldn't figure out where that was coming from. But I figured out when we were setting up for this episode. Learn so something we, new every day. Yeah. We used to set the UMask in one of the login files, like one of the, I think it was Etsy Bash RC. That no longer is how we set it. Instead, in post login, hmm. we have these session rules to craft the user's session on the machine. One of them is Pam UMask which sets the user's UMask. Now you know what to file a bug against if you don't like it. What we can do is change the options past to PAM UMask to change its behavior. Passing the argument saying my machine uses user private groups or user groups, the PAM library that's responsible for setting the you mask for your session sets it to the user private group you mask instead or you can just dump you mask 0002 into everyone's bash rc totally and do that inefficient every new user you create too you got to keep propagating the change or you can just and hope it never changes because then you have to change it for all the users right or you can just add an argument to the spam library and there you go it's now effective for all users that log in the machine that have their username and their primary group name are the same things. Stop with your simple and efficient administration ideas. I refuse. <laughs> the other thing I want to show you is we talked about how you could add different authentication sources. There are additional PAM libraries you can add to. And a bunch of them come with RHEL. So like the LDAP one, the IDM, mm -hmm. or, you know, IDM or AD integration stuff, that all comes with RHEL. But there are others that are extra. And where do we go for extra packages, Nate? Apple. Extra packages for enterprise Linux. I'm going to do a, a DNF list available for Pam. This machine doesn't have Apple installed. That's not great. Poor planning, Scott. Yep. I used a different sandbox last night when I was testing. At least you didn't give Bob a generic username like test user. I'm so embarrassed. Indeed. One second, I'm grabbing. Scott is Googling for the command to enable Apple. Right. <laughs> <sighs> the reason it's not enabled out of the box is these extra packages are not supported by Red Hat. When you install our RELs, Apple is an option. It can give you things that are not included with RHEL. Just keep in mind that not supported by Red Hat. All right, let's see here. So we'll install the Apple repository. Then I'll do my DNF list again. 
and it's downloading all the metadata from Apple. There we go. You can see there's a PAM radius. If you have a radius server, you can authenticate that with PAM radius. Man, so you're taking me back. Taking me yep. back. <laughs> Some people still use RHEL 4, but there's <laughs> PAM you can authenticate with your UB keys. The one I'm going to throw go. is PAM 2FA for two-factor authentication. Good choice. There was a lot of conversation about multi-factor and uh, two-factor in the chat. So there you go. Good, good, good choice, Scott. Uh, sometimes I make good choices. Yeah. Not often. You saw the future and knew this. When you install a, a module, some that already came with RHEL, like uh, PAM Unix, they have man pages. So if you wanted to read about like what arguments you can pass, or what the arguments do, there's documentation for all of these. But I just installed PAM2FA. And unfortunately, PAM2FA does not have a man page. It does, however, I have a markdown-based readme. All right, so. It says, hey, here's uh, PAM2FA. You could do two-factor authentication, including things like Google Authenticator, YubiKey, OTP. So there's a bunch of options for how you're doing your two-factor authentication. All right, we don't need to worry about building it because we got it from Apple already built. All right, it says, to use this, you need to put this into your PAM config. So, oops, we're going to Etsy. PAM.D system auth. We're just going to throw it in there. Good idea. What could go wrong? We could put it anywhere we want. Can't we? Probably not. No. Shouldn't it be after the ENV at least? Or is it, it should be after the password, like after the PAM Unix. Who knows? But let me tell you some, some decision criteria. I like your idea that should be below PAM EMV because that sets environment variables for the PAM. All right, let's fix that. All right, should it be above or below PAM Unix? PAM Unix checks for local user accounts. If it's okay that somebody types in their username and password, then maybe it should be below. Well, I get And I don't know if this is the right way to do it or not, but in my brain, I'm thinking you change... PAM Unix to required, not sufficient, and the MFA to also required, right? So you don't want to do that because if you change the PAM Unix to required, that means I am requiring a local user account. Okay. I actually think that maybe for the purposes of this, we could do something like... that. Depending on what you want to do, you could change it to be sufficient. It's okay if you have a local username and password without two-factor authentication. Maybe. That's what the PAM Unix line currently says. Yeah. And two of That's what I was thinking. Yeah. So what we could do is this. Authenticate with your two-factor authentication, that's good enough. And we don't have to go any further. If you're not able to authenticate with two-factor, if you're a local user account, that would also be acceptable. One of two-factor that I'm forcing you to do both it should be a password and uh, the second factor. That's uh, why I thought they should be set to required. So if you are using two-factor, that's good enough. But that's the only thing that's good enough. So if you don't successfully authenticate with two-factor, you get that PAM deny, which kicks you out. Does the two-factor module also ask for your password then? It will. And so if we go there. back... That's what I'm missing. Okay. I didn't yeah. look at the man page. That's probably <laughs> my fault. All right. Uh, so down here, uh, they give you the arguments that can be passed to the two-factor module. Okay. Uh, things like... Your LDAP URI, what's the LDAP server that you authenticate against, um, or the Google authentication stuff that you authenticate against. So 
there's a there's options there or maybe we do pam unix where we log in with their username and password that's good but we also require that they put in a token or something with two factor so it would be good enough to have the local user account but you also are required to put in the two factor you know token code or something in order to complete the authentication Ordering is important. The severity that you yes. type is important because that's going to dictate how Pam treats the treats the requirements for your login. All right, I'm going to do something silly. All right, so here's what I've done. Nate, you'll notice I've not added any arguments my, to my two FA. Yeah, yeah. So there's there's no it's way, I can, uh, and it's required. So like it's going to fail. Uh, so. Right, so it'll ask me hey, which password. Hold on, that worked. I wasn't expecting it to work. Oh, 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 I remember why. I put it in the wrong file. So we have these tests, oh. Scott. That's right. So I added my stuff over in system auth. Oh, but not SSH or remote auth or whatever it's called. Password auth, yeah. So let me. Uh, So let's try this. There we go. Now that I've properly broken the system, broken it in the right way. That's right. Not broken it in the wrong way that I can't troubleshoot and fix. All right. So this is the same kind of dialogue that you would get if you put in the wrong password. And I know that was a question earlier, we were talking about it earlier with like, if I lock a password, what happens? This is the kind of thing that happens. We don't give away information that the state of the machine is the problem. So even though we're failing this PAM call, we're not told it's because we're failing this PAM call. However, as root on the local machine, We are told right here, bam, PAM2FA is failing because there's no configured second factors. And then we end up not being able to pass our PAM config because even though I'm providing the right password, I'm not able to get a valid response on the PAM2FA library call. And again, if we do something like, change the severity of our rule. So I went from required to optional. Now it doesn't matter whether I pass or fail the PAM 2FA module. All right, it lets me log into the system. Now it did provide the local user account some error messaging saying, hey, this thing's not working right. You should contact somebody. But that was because I was successfully able to authenticate with my local user account, which allowed me to progress through the, the PAM stack of authentication checks, sessions, and account checks. Congratulations. So, You've successfully yeah. configured, but incorrectly multi-factor. Well, and if we looked at the Varlog Secure, it would still complain that we're failing that yeah. check, right? Right. So if you're having... If you're messing around with PAM stuff and um, two, two words of warning, have an open session as root because even root authenticates with PAM. If you mess yeah. with PAM and you can't authenticate anymore, you're not gonna be able to authenticate new root sessions. So have you an open- You can lock open... yourself out pretty good if you uh, mess up PAM good enough. We have an open login session so that you can use that to change anything that might be incorrect. Um, test, 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 test. And then look at things like Varlook Secure to verify that your tests aren't producing errors that maybe you just aren't noticing because other PAM checks are passing because you have the wrong severity or something else. 